Sound speeds, but when it's not, we say a shot is being recorded MOS, which means no sound is being recorded along with picture. What is the origin of that? Let's take a little history lesson and we will discuss this, starting off with a brief history of where sound came from. Back in 1877, Thomas Edison created something called a phonograph cylinder, and then a gramophone disc, which we now know to be records, uh, was created by Emil Berliner in 1889. And as we know, that format was the primary format that music and everything was distributed until almost 100 years later when the magnetic audio cassette took over as the main format for sound mainly because people could listen to it in their cars and record their own very cheaply and easily. If you happen to be someone that has heard of the phonatogram, then you will say, well, wait a minute, back in 1857, it was recording sound, or rather it was recording vibrations it picked up from the air and put it onto paper. But it was not possible to actually listen to it at all until 2008 when computers were able to scan it and produce the sound for it, but it doesn't exactly sound very good. That is supposed to be a French folk song, but it happens to be what they say is the oldest recording there is in 1860. Now, compare that to Alexander Graham Bell in 1885 in his first recording. Hey, I can actually make out what he's saying, and that's probably because it was recorded a few decades later on an actual disc itself, one of these wax discs that we were talking about. Ten years later, in 1895, they were doing experiments with radio and sending sound through the air. But let's pause on sound for a moment. The first film camera was invented by Woodsward Donisthorpe in 1876, but it was William Freese Green who, in 1885, figured out a way to take oiled paper, strips of it, thin strips, and run it through the camera to create about 10 frames per second. But when he displayed this technology, it didn't exactly work out so well because it was not very reliable. A few years later, William Kennedy Laurie Dixon, who was a Thomas Edison employee, invented something called the kinetographic camera, which used sprocketed film and had an electric motor to progress the film through the camera. But wait, Thomas Edison, haven't we heard that name before when we were talking about sound? Yes, indeed, we have. From the 1890s, when, when film started to be taken seriously, there were talks about trying to figure out a way to get sound to work with the film. Technology wasn't quite there, though. Early paper film that would run across a hot bulb for projection purposes would quite frequently catch fire, which led to the invention of cellulose. Cellulose is what we typically think of when we think of film today. However, early film was nitrate-based, and it was prone to self-igniting. Yes, that's right. Early film would just spontaneously combust, which caused a lot of problem in film theaters, especially when you run it across a hot projection. Bulb. For this reason, we do not have a lot of early nitrate film in our film archives because it would spontaneously burst into flame and reduce itself to a goo and later dust. Early film cameras, like before 1900, were very big and cumbersome and you couldn't exactly take them anywhere. That is, until you made it more portable. And the easiest thing to do to make it more portable was to get rid of the electric motor. That allowed it to shrink down and made it a lot more portable for the road. There was a couple of problems with that though. By making it portable, you had to introduce a hand crank for the film to be hand cranked by the camera operator through the camera. Camera operators would claim that they could hand crank the camera at exactly 16 frames per second, which matched the projection frames per second. However, now we know that from testing the old film, they actually hand crank between about 12 and 40 frames per second. Of course, the faster they cranked, the more film they used per second, and when they projected it back, people would be moving very slowly. 
The opposite is true as well. If you hand cranked at 12 frames per second and you played back at 16, people would be moving a little on the fast side. And it was 1910 before the Aeroscope camera finally made the electric motor possible on a portable camera. But having just any electric motor did not work. But with the 1906 invention of the Audion electronic amplifying tube, which allowed sound to be amplified, and the 1926 Vitafoam sound to disc system, it seemed like sound working with the motion picture industry was going to soon be a reality. But there was still a big issue, synchronizing picture to sound. That is, until the invention of the Selsen electric motor. Selsen, or self-synchronizing motors, allowed the audio recording equipment and the camera itself to become synchronized. Okay, so now picture and sound are being recorded together, but it still took the invention of the clapper to match up the picture with the sound in editing. Great, so everything worked out, right? Not exactly. Early film cameras were extremely noisy, and that did not exactly work well for those early 1926 condenser microphones. So in order to fix this, studios built soundproof booths and put the camera and the camera operators in there, and the camera was allowed to see out through a very thick piece of glass. This, of course, also marked the camera department not really liking the sound department. Of course, some of us in the sound department would also argue that cameras haven't gotten a lot quieter since then. So controlling noises on the stage was a very big deal. This, of course, was decades and decades before digital audio workstation DAWs like Reaper and wonderful programs like Isotope were even thought of. And even the early audio recording equipment vibrated a lot and was noisy by nature. So what they did is they put this recording equipment into its own separate recording room, as they called it. And by connecting up microphones on a stage to a control panel, multiple stages were able to use the same recording equipment. This did help a little with the increased expense that came along with recording sound. So when they wanted to record sound on set, the sound man mixer would intercom to the sound recordist in the recording room and tell him to roll. The sound recordist would then start the motor and start recording the sound. Now, it took a while for the machine to get up to speed, and when it did, he would intercom back to the sound man on stage and say, speed, and therefore the sound man would yell out speed, which we now know to be sound speeds, to indicate that picture and sound was being recorded together and now in sync. I will ask the operator now to start the rest of the recording machinery. And yes, there was a kill switch on the camera which prevented the motor from starting up if the camera people were doing something like changing out the film or changing the lens. And yes, that does mean that the power that ran the camera motor was actually located in the sound recording room. And just like today, sometimes there were shots that did not involve sound. And in those circumstances, they would have the sound man intercom to the sound recorders and say, roll the motor only. Or, as it later became known, this is going to be a motor only shot. Or, MOS. My friends and family will tell you that I'm good in going off on tangents, so let's take one. In 1927, The Jazz Singer was the very first movie that used this synchronized sound. Now, it was still a very expensive process to do, so not the whole movie was actually synchronized sound. Most of it was still considered to be a silent movie, and it still put up the black screen with the words on it, and there's still music playing over it, but then for the parts that actually involved the synchronized audio, you still needed to be in sync. And this, of course, is where Vitaphone really came into play here because their sound on disc system meant that not just the music and the sound effects could be synchronized, but now the voice could as well. A year later in 1928 for the movie Beggars of Life, director William A. Wellman wanted to do a tracking shot with his two main actors. The sound man said, no, that doesn't work. I need them to speak into the microphone that's behind the flowery vase. This, of course, did not make the director happy, and ignoring the sound man, grabbed the microphone, put it over the end of a broom, and held it over the actors for the tracking shot. That's right, you heard it correctly. The very first boom operator was a director. It was, of course, the following year in 1929 when, for the movie The Wild Party, director Dorothy Arzner directed technicians to put a microphone on the end of a fishing rod so that way it could be held over actress Clara Bow so that she could roam around on the set while talking. So there's my tangent. Now you now know that MOS actually stands for Motor Only Shot. Now wait a second, I know you may have heard the whole thing about a 1920s German director that would say, I want to do this shot 
mit out sound. That is only myth. As a matter of fact, it's gone so far that people have even speculated as to who these people could be. I'm not going to try to pronounce their names, but they're below if you want to look them up. And if you look at a film strip itself, like the kind of film strip that you would use to project out to a theater, just on the inside of the sprocket holes on one side, you will see an optical strip. That's where the sound used to be recorded. If there was no strip, it was considered MOS for minus optical strip, and that meant there was no sound on that film. Well, there you have it, MOS. For more information, there are links down in the description. And if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the comment section down below. And in the meantime, I will see you next time. Have a question you'd like answered or want to add something? Be sure to write it in the comment section down below. You can also make a suggestion for future topics of discussion. Again, comment section down below or you can email me at soundspeeds at yahoo.com. Be sure to subscribe and turn on notifications so you won't miss out on future sound advice.